you know, all the memes that go around that are like sorting cattle with my husband is just like a cussing match. You know, Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be that way. Like, I think that that's one area, like a blatant example of where this could be very beneficial. Hey, hey, it's Shay Keister, and I'm your host and the founder of Casual Cattle Conversations, a global rancher education company that strives to bring honest thoughts and conversations from ranchers and leaders to other ranchers. Be sure to follow Cattle Convos on social media to have more in-depth conversations around the ranching business and lifestyle brought to you. If you are ready to take your operation to the next level and improve your lifestyle too, send me a message about my Rancher Mind group. Rancher Minds are monthly roundtable discussions for ranchers to learn from peers and experts and leave the call with actionable advice to make changes on their own operations. With that, let's see who our guest is today and what experience and advice they have to offer you to improve your own operation. Alrighty folks, let's take a second to hear from our friends at Red Angus. Mark your calendars for the 69th Annual National Red Angus Convention, September 14th through the 16th in Kalispell, Montana. The Commercial Cattlemen Symposium kicks off the week and has a focus on heifer development and female marketing. Producer panels will discuss nutrition, marketing, and extension specialists from the University of Missouri and industry stakeholders will keynote the event to share perspective on successfully developing and marketing heifers. The final two days of convention are full of high-quality education and entertainment, with keynote addresses from Damian Mason, an agriculture trend speaker and humorist, Don Schiefelbein, National Cattlemen's Beef Association President, Jessica Spreitzer, the Director of Trade Analysis for the U.S. Meat Export Federation, and Taryn Dreeling, an Enneagram coach and podcaster. The wide variety of speakers, plus updates from Red Angus leadership and committees, provides a valuable lineup for every beef producer. Located near Glacier National Park, Kalispell is a prime location to visit with the family. Attend the convention and stay afterwards for a great family vacation. Registration is now open for the National Red Angus Convention. Visit redangus.org to sign up and book your travel for a can't miss convention. All right, Taryn. Well, we have met in person before and had some chats um, on Instagram mainly, but I'm excited to have you on the show today to talk about the Enneagram, which is probably a new topic or even vocab word in the vocabulary for a lot of listeners, but uh, I think they'll find a lot of interest in how it can impact working with their family today. So, I mean, to start off, do you just kind of want to talk about your background and what you do? Because from what I can tell, you wear a lot of different hats. So how would you describe what you do? (laughs) Sure. Well, first, I want to say thanks for having me today. I'm really excited about our conversation. Uh, So my husband and I ranch in the Sandhills of Nebraska with our three kids. Um, We work for a larger ranch. And so um, that's our day to day. That's what I share online on my social media. Uh, faith, family, and beef, switching over to Taryn Dreeling. Um, And then we also own a small herd of our own Red Angus cows in partnership with my in-laws. So I do, I mean, I, I call myself a rancher, but I also run my social media channels, freelance for Working Ranch Magazine, and recently stepped into the world of Enneagram coaching. Okay. So since we're on the topic, what is the Enneagram? Like, how would you describe that for someone who's never heard of it before? Right. Yeah. The Enneagram is a personality typing system and it's comprised of nine core types. And it is, I would say different than all of the other personality typing systems, typology systems that you can do like Myers-Briggs, the colors, the strengths finders. Um, I've always been really interested in personality typing systems, but this one has by far helped me the most because where the other systems tell you your behaviors and traits And that's sort of how they categorize you into your type. The Enneagram is determined by your motivations. So what drives you to do all that you do? So rather than telling you what you do, it tells you why you do it. And I think that is 
very, very helpful. Or that's what makes the Enneagram more helpful because I use the analogy of a car, like your car is running crappy and you know, it's running crappy, but you can't fix it unless you know why it's running crappy. So if there's things in your life that you're like, I know this could be better, but you don't know why the, you know, the cause of it, Mm -hmm. you can't really fix it. And so the Enneagram kind of sheds a light on different areas that the other personality typing systems don't always do. So you talked about how it's like more based on like what motivates you. Is that the only difference? Or would you say there's other differences in there too, on how it differs with your Myers-Briggs strength finder colors, whatever it may be. I mean, I've, t- I know I've personally taken all of those tests and then some plus Enneagram, but like, what else would you say would be the differences between Enneagram and other typing tests? So I would say that that the motivations is the main difference. I would also say that the more that I'm learning the more that I could probably have a really close guess of what your Myers-Briggs type is based on what your Enneagram type is, um, or like it, with the strengths finder, I could probably tell you your, a few of your top strengths, just knowing what your Enneagram is. So where I don't think that you can, I don't think you can look at strengths finder or Myers-Briggs and know what someone's Enneagram type is. Does that make sense? Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. And personally, I say that I agree because I had all the other personality tests until I like dove into Enneagram. That's when I was like, okay, this, everything kind of made sense. And I was able to kind of able to tie them together. But would you talk about like, why, I mean, you gave the car analogy already, but why is it important to understand our own personality types? Um, I mean, as we're working with people in life in general, like, why is it important to have an understanding of our personality types? I am so glad you asked this question because, um, I'm sort of making a shift, not really making a shift, but I've clarified my why in my business recently. And this, the clarity started a few years ago and it's just gotten clear, like the, like the image was fuzzy at first and now it's just clearer and clearer and clearer. But, um, I'm a big proponent of good movement. And where I say that the image was fuzzy was we have this phrase in stockmanship, good movement draws good movement. And so I was sitting in the pasture. It was actually more than a couple years ago. It was six years ago. I was sitting in the pasture watching pears trail. I was moving them to a new pasture by myself several hundred head of pears by myself. And I'm watching the pears trail through the gate. And it it was actually 2016. And we were in the, like just gearing up for a really awesome election season (laughs) and and note the sarcasm there. Um, And I was seeing all the division online. And I was thinking to myself, watching these pears go through, like, good movement draws good movement. And it doesn't just apply to our cattle. Like if we want our cattle to move, we have to understand them and how to communicate with them. And in order to do that, we have to understand ourselves because it starts with us. The good movement starts with us. And that same thing applies to humans. And so the reason that the Enneagram is beneficial and important is because it shines a light on things that you might not be aware of in your self. So it brings a lot of self-awareness. And when we're self-aware, we can be more empathetic. We can listen better. We can, we can do all the things to communicate with other humans and our animals much better when we're self-aware. And so that's one thing that I, I will talk till I'm blue in the face about the Enneagram is how it helps you communicate with other people through self-awareness. I think that's really important. And I appreciate the ranch analogy with that too. And it, it is like anything with moving cattle, you have to understand how to communicate with them. And I think so often we forget how to communicate with other people and really communicate with ourselves too. And so that's important to understand that. So you know, do you want to talk about, you know, you've hit why it's important, what it is, but 
can you briefly touch on what the nine types are and how they're different to really help people understand, like really hit home on why um, people communicate differently in a sense, because depending on their type. Yes. I'll just run down briefly the motivations of each type and kind of their um, archetype name. Mm -hmm. So starting with a type eight, and there's a reason for this. If we start with type eight, they'll stick around and pay attention for all the other types. And if you start with type seven, they'll be like, looking up things about themselves and not pay attention. So we start with eight, end with seven. So type eight is called the challenger and they are motivated by self-reliance. So they don't want to have to rely on anyone else for any reason. Um, they fear betrayal. So that's why they, they, they don't want to have to rely on anyone else. Their motivation is self-reliance. These people are also very honest, direct, straightforward, blunt to the point. And that can sometimes come off as them being rude. They're not being rude. That's just their talk style. I mean, they can be rude. Everyone can be rude, <laughs> but in general, these people are just, they don't have time for fluff. Uh, the type nine is called the peacemaker. I am a type nine. We are motivated by keeping the peace. We fear conflict, loss of connection. And so we will do just about anything to keep inner, our inner peace and peace around us. Even if that means going along to get along type nines are often described as easygoing laid back type nines also of note about the type nine. And this is actually something that really has been beneficial for me to know about myself and other people type nines can't not see a lot of sides of situations. So type nine, see many, many shades of gray. And I say, can't not, that's a double negative because there are times that I wish I could just see my own side and not see any other perspective, but I can't not, I can't not. And so knowing that about myself and knowing that not everyone else has that ability has helped me extend a lot of grace to people. I just, if I see someone being like stuck in the mud on something, I just say, you know what? Maybe they can't see another way. Maybe this is the only way they can see. So that's been helpful for me. The type one is called the reformer. Some people call it the perfectionist, but I prefer reformer because I feel like it's a more accurate depiction of the type one. They are motivated by perfection. They fear being seen as bad or wrong. So everything that they do is in order to do it right or good. They actually strive to be perfect. Like a lot of people want perfection, but they want to be perfect, which is obviously unattainable. And of note of the type ones, they have an inner critic. This is they're the only type that has this. And this is different than negative self-talk. Negative self-talk comes out when we are, um, like when we make a mistake and it, it's usually, I did this thing wrong. I'm such an idiot, you know, things like that. The inner critic is with these people 24, seven, 365 days a year, all the time, all day, every day. And it uses, words like you are bad, you are not doing this correctly. It's very critical. So they have that inner critic, which they can turn the volume down on, but they can never get rid of the inner critic. The type two is called the helper. Their motivation is love and appreciation. And they fear, um, not, not being loved or not being helpful. So they are, they are everything that they do is driven by that love and appreciation or need for love and appreciation. So these are the people that can walk into the room and see who needs help and go help them without asking. And they also have a hard time saying no. So they're the ones that will also make the cookies for the church bake sale, even if they don't really want to make the cookies. <laughs> um, and of note about the type two, the helper, the helpers, they, they don't realize that they have needs themselves. So their weakness is pride. And that pride comes in the form of believing that everyone else has 
needs and they don't. And they also don't know that the rest of us who aren't twos don't have the ability to just automatically know when they need help and help them without them having to be asked. So that can be a cause of some resentment for them because they're like, I need help. They should know. Why aren't they helping me? But they don't always realize that that we don't have that superpower that they have. The type three is called the achiever. And the type three is motivated by admiration and affirmation. So they fear uh, be, being seen as worthless or unsuccessful. And, and what I mean by admiration and affirmation is they want to be admired and they want people to let them know that they admire them. So threes are, I like to call them magicians because once they set their mind to something, they, they can just make it happen. They have a lot of energy. They're very goal oriented and driven of note about the threes. Um, they have the ability to walk into the room and read the room sort of like twos, but instead of knowing who needs help and helping them, they know who, uh, the room needs them to be. And then they can show that side of themselves to the room. So type threes are really good at fitting in anywhere they are. Okay. Type fours are the individualist. Their motivation is uniqueness. So they fear being the same as other people. They also have some fear of abandonment because they believe that they're too unique, that no one will like them for who they are. So that's where that fear of abandonment comes in. So everything the four does is driven by that uniqueness. Fours also are the biggest feelers on the Enneagram. This does not mean they get their feelings hurt easy. This means that they essentially wear their emotions on their sleeve. They're not afraid to feel feelings like some of us are, and they're not afraid to share feelings with other people. Uh, they also can sometimes fall into this trap of believing that they're missing some sort of normal that the rest of us have that they don't have. Um, that that in fact is false. Like nobody's normal, you know, <laughs> but that's something that they believe. Fours are also generally very, very creative individuals. They find a different way to do lots of things. My best friend, she's a CPA and she's a four, and she has found a different way to be a CPA, like different from any other CPA I've ever met. And I don't mean like creative accounting, like some people think of creative accounting. I mean, like she really, instead of just doing your numbers, she builds a relationship with you. So that's how she does that differently. The type five is the investigator and their motivation is knowledge. So they fear being seen as incapable or incompetent or having their energy reserve depleted. So they wake up. This is an interesting fact about fives. They wake up every day with a set amount of energy. And they can watch that energy gauge. Like a, I think of it as a fuel gauge. They watch the gauge go down, down, down. The closer it gets to E, they're very aware. And so then they will need to get away and refuel. Type fives also will, like they are very driven by knowledge. So they are well-researched, um, well thought out. They will never say anything off the cuff. So if you hear a type five say something really strange. And you are like, where did that come from? Ask them because they never say anything off the cuff. Um, and if you're in conversation with a type five and they're giving you a blank stare and you think they're not listening, they are, they just don't have the information they need to engage right at that moment, but they will come back later. Or you can ask them later if they're ready to have that conversation. The type six is the loyalist and their motivation is security and support. So they fear, fear. They're very, they're, um, and, and lacking security and support. So type sixes are called the loyalist because they are very loyal individuals. Once they make a decision, that is the decision because, excuse me, like the type one has the inner critic, the type six has an, an inner committee. And I picture it like a boardroom with a big table full of board members, all 
talking very loudly, spouting off different, differing opinions, perspectives, viewpoints, et cetera, very, very loud. And so it's not critical. It's just a lot of noise. And so once they make that decision, it's that decision. And they have a hard time moving on from that or changing their mind because they don't want to have to go back into the noise in their mind. And, uh, I, I, I also tell people like, if you're friends with a type six and you break their trust, you're dead to them because they, they, they already had to consult the inner committee to trust you in the first place. And then you broke the trust and now they don't want to have to go back there and consult. The type seven is the enthusiast. So type sevens are driven by happiness and fulfillment. That's their motivation, happiness and fulfillment. And I know some of you might be thinking, well, I want happiness and fulfillment too. And that's true. A lot of us do, but that's not what drives us. That is literally what drives the type seven. They are constantly looking for the next fun thing to fill their cup. Type sevens are, um, individuals who can sometimes struggle with shiny object syndrome. So if it's not fun, you, you actually will hear type seven say a lot. I quit that because it wasn't fun. This isn't fun. That isn't fun. So if it's not fun for them, they're not going to keep doing it. They're going to move on to the next fun thing. All right. I think you got one through nine there. I did. (laughs) So that's, that's really interesting. And what I think is, you know, before you talked about motivation, but you also talked about fear and what core fears are too. So I think that's interesting how you tied that in and how that's important to each type as well. Now, how do people, um, officially type themselves? Because like I've, you know, I took a few quizzes I've done like some research and I visited with you, but like when it came to like, working with my parents to each have them do it. It's kind of something where we just kind of turned to online quizzes and thought about it. So we, you know, maybe have an idea, but is that an accurate way? Because we personally want to use it to help work with each other better on our operation. But how do you find the most accurate typing to better understand yourself and those you're around? Yeah, there are a couple of different ways you can go about this. I will say that if you choose to do an online test or quiz, Uh, don't stop there because the AI is good, but I still don't think it's very good at gauging motivations. And sometimes as humans, we subconsciously choose answers that we want to be instead of what we actually are. And it's not that we're necessarily trying to do it that way. Like I said, it's subconscious. So if you're going to take a test or a quiz, I recommend grabbing a book like the road back to you by Ian Morgan Cron and Suzanne Stabile and doing a little more research or or read the book and read about maybe like if the, if the quiz gives you top three types, you can skip to those types first, but I recommend reading all the types because it's just good to know about all the other types as well, but focus on the motivations. And so when I brought up the fear, when we were going through the nine types, that's part of our motivation. So our motivations are made up of our fear, desire, weakness and longing. So the weakness is what we struggle with. And then the longing is what we want to hear to counteract the lies we tell ourselves. So that's what your motivation is made up of those four things. And so it's important to focus on those four things and it's going to take self-reflection. So that's one way you can do it quiz and then read. You can skip the quiz altogether and just read, or you can come find an Enneagram coach such as myself who offers typing sessions and we can help guide you there. So we cannot tell you your type and you cannot tell anyone else their type because it's based in motivations and not behaviors. And because of other nuances through the Enneagram, like wings and where we are in stress and security and our instinctual subtypes, our dominant instinctual subtypes, uh, Two people of the same core type with the same motivations can behave very differently. So that's why we cannot type other people because we only see their behaviors and we don't know their motivations. Only they know their motivations. So, but working with an Enneagram coach, we can help guide you there. Listening, we'll ask you questions. We'll listen to the language you use. We'll kind of guide you 
will narrow, help you narrow it down and guide you. And then we will, if you're working with me, we'll discuss all the nine types and, and then you will decide I am this, but it, any, any way you choose to do it, test reading, working with an Enneagram coach, it's going to take honesty and self-reflection. I think that's really good input on that. Um, so have you, like you've worked individually with, um, people to help them discover their Enneagram type. Have you worked with, um, groups of employees that work with a business or different ranch families? How have you, and when you do that, how do you see that impacting, um, the productivity of their businesses and their work life relationships? What's the impact of that understanding? Yeah. So I, I haven't done any for several months because calving and branding and all of that, but <laughs> I actually had the opportunity to do four workshops with all of, well, all of the employees were split up. So it was four workshops total. And I covered all the employees of the ranch we work for. And it has been really interesting to see because I'm so close to it here. Like I can actually stick around and see what happens. And it's been really fun to see how the communication has changed based on what people know about each other now, because, um, everyone shared their type with everyone else. So everyone knows, but then also it's been fun for me when the guys will come and ask questions or email me questions or, you know, I, so when I do these workshops with groups of people, I don't just leave you hanging and like, here's your type. Good luck. No, like you get support afterwards. And so that's been really, they've asked a lot of really good questions and it's been really fun to see the, the communication dynamic improve now that everyone knows everyone else's type. So that's really cool. So like, what are some of those questions? I mean, because like you said, it's not like, here's your type, you're good to go. I mean, how there comes a point where you have to implement that understanding and start using that in your life. So, you know, how, I guess maybe a better question is once you kind of discover your type, how do you start implementing that into your life and using that knowledge to your advantage? Right. So, um, one of the ways to do this is to take a look at where your core type, I I referenced nuance before, and I said where we are in stress and security. So when we're stressed out, we can take on the negative type traits of our stress number. So each type is connected to four other types. So I'll use myself as an example. As a type nine, my wings, which are the numbers on either side of my core type, eight and one, those are my wings, eight and one. So knowing that those are my wings, I can pay attention and um, I wings are like a seasoning or additional, like they add to your type. So for me as a type nine, my eight wing, where a type nine would try to avoid conflict at all costs, my type eight wing helps me engage in conflict when I need to. I have a stronger eight wing than my one wing. The one wing helps me be more organized, structured, et cetera. Um, And then the stress and security number for the type nine, nines slide into the negative traits of type six when they're stressed. So remember the motivation of six is security and support. Sixes are the most worrisome, fearful type on the Enneagram. So when I'm stressed out, I, I worry, or I feel anxious. My chest gets tight. Like I think worst case scenario sort of things. Um, and then when I'm on my growth path or my security path, that's to the type three. And so that's where I can get moving because type nines have a hard time moving forward because we're trying to avoid conflict and anything that disrupts our inner peace. And sometimes change disrupts our Mm -hmm. inner peace. And so even like good chains, like chasing after goals and stuff is hard because it disrupts us. So when I'm on my growth path or taking on the positive traits of my security number, which is the type three, remember they're the achiever. 
then I can get stuff done. I can meet those goals. I can move forward in my business or whatever it is that I'm trying to get done. I can do that there. So that's one of the ways that it's beneficial is to know where, where you go and what you do in stress and security, because typically we'll have triggers that send us into what I call our stress hole, which is like, you can't control it. It's saving you from yourself. Uh, Suzanne Stabile, who I listen to and read a lot of her work. She says that it's a good thing that type nines go to six in stress because otherwise they would never worry about anything. (laughs) So it's like (laughs) saving me from being like, Oh, it is what it is all the time. Like I worry about something. So the stress slide is not always a bad thing. It's, it's to save you from yourself. And also when you become more self-aware, you can figure out those triggers. And then instead of sliding into the stress hole and taking on the negative traits, you can use the positive traits of your stress number. So instead of thinking worst case scenario and getting anxious and tight chested about it, I can think worst case scenario and make a plan for what I do if that happens. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I, I appreciate you going into like what wings are and then you know, your stress type or then, then, um, like you said, um, the growth or security as well, because I know when I first started getting into it, I was a little confused because it was like, I definitely did do mostly identify as a three, but like you said, the wings are sprinkles. And sometimes I see myself in, depending on the scenario, I can see myself in other types. So that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, I can see how that would be really valuable to know. So if my dad's an eight, you know, where does he go when he's stressed and that would help me communicate as well. So no, that's pretty neat. So with that, you know, you kind of hit everything. We've talked about why it's important to understand your personality and um, direct impacts or changes you've seen with um, different groups of businesses or ranchers working together and, you know, explain the Enneagram as a whole. Is there anything else you want to add or think that, you know, the ranchers listening to this podcast need to understand about the Enneagram Enneagram and the benefits that, um, it can make in their life. Yeah. Um, I just think that this is such a great tool, especially for those of us in agriculture to understand, because typically we're working, most of us in agriculture are working with family members. I mean, what's, what's the statistic like 97%, 97 or 98% are family owned. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think it's could, I don't think it could be, I think it is a beneficial tool for families to use, or those of us in agriculture, um, no matter whether it's family or an operation like ours, um, or the one we work for where it's not necessarily family, but we're all working closely together because it will save a lot of stress. You know, you know, all the memes that go around that are like sorting cattle with my husband is just like a cussing match. You know, Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be that way. Like, I think that that's one area, like a blatant example of where this could be very beneficial, uh, using myself and my husband as an example, like he's a type one. I know that I know that he has the inner critic and he wants things to be perfect. I know that sometimes that inner critic gets so loud that it comes out his mouth and it's not necessarily directed at me. It's just that he has to let it out before I knew he was a type one. I felt very differently about working with him. Now I know he's not actually being critical of me when we're sorting cattle. He's just letting what's in his head because Sorting cattle does not always go perfect. (laughs) No, it does not. (laughs) I mean, whether we want it to, whether we're doing everything that, that we're supposed to be doing, we're doing it all right. It just doesn't always work out the way we want it to or perfectly. So I know that when that critical stuff comes out his mouth, he's not mad at me. And so I can extend him grace and let it slide. It's and, and before I knew that it was a lot harder to extend grace. He knows that I'm a type nine. He knows that he cannot, um, make like, he can't expect me to make a decision like that. Like I need time 
to make a decision. And the, the sorting cattle example is not applicable here because in that moment you kind of have to decide whether you're going to step forward or step back or close the gate or open it. But this is like, he gives me a little bit extra time because he knows I see all those shades of gray. And so I need a little time to decide which shade of gray I'm going to choose that day. So it's just really, really helpful to know and to know how people communicate. And when we were talking about the type five and I said, they have an energy reserve, they wake up with a set amount of energy every day and they watch it go down when it's on empty, you cannot expect them to engage in conversation. So if you know that someone you work with is a type five and it's the end of the day, and you're trying to send them a text to make a plan for the next day, or you are expecting them to respond to you right away, that's an unrealistic expectation and you need to extend them some grace. The type eights, they're very direct and blunt. If you know that, you know that you can extend grace to the type eight that you work with when they are talking to you straightforward, blunt, direct to the point, and you don't have to have hurt feelings about it because they're not trying to hurt your feelings. That's how they communicate. And on the flip side of that, I appreciate being in the presence of type eights because I know I can talk to them the exact same way. And I don't have to worry about causing conflict between us because I know they're not going to be offended if I say what I mean or what I actually think instead of trying to soften it. They don't need it softened. So those are just a few examples. Well, thank you very much for that. And I would say with that, I mean, I think it's just good because even if you don't know what someone else's type is, I mean, it's important to grant people grace, no matter how they're acting, because people are people and everyone's different. So I think that's something else to keep in mind out of all of this too. And I'm glad that you brought that up because a lot of times people will ask me, well, how can I type my spouse? How can I type my coworker? You can't, you can't type your coworker, but that doesn't mean that you cannot use the Enneagram as a tool to improve your own communication. Remember, because like when I was talking about the good movement, it starts with us. So as a type nine, I know I'm prone to being passive aggressive. So I'll say things like, Hmm, the trash is getting kind of full instead of saying, would you please take the trash out? So effective communication starts with us and the Enneagram helps us shine light on areas that we can improve on. So it doesn't have to be, we don't have to know everybody's type to use it as a tool for improvement. Well, awesome. Thank you very much, Taryn. I, uh, I think that wraps up, that wraps up everything I had questions for and, uh, done a lot more. You did a great job today. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Let's hear it again and thank our sponsor, the Red Angus Association of America for bringing this episode to us. The cow, no wonder they call her the foundation female. On her shoulders rests the genetic basis of any cow herd, so it's critical she measures up to your expectations for stability and fertility. How can you create more high-quality females while eliminating the guesswork and upfront costs that accompany heifer development? The Red Angus Association of America has launched Red Choice, a program designed to aid producers in developing the highest quality heifers through genomic testing, AI technology, and veterinarian partnerships. Heifers that meet the criteria are more likely to stay in the herd, propagate the best genetics, and make a positive impact on your bottom line. Learn more about Red Choice at redangus.org. And that's a wrap on that one. Be sure to let me know your thoughts on the episode. And if you have any further questions around the topic, take care and have a great day.